Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. And if you are interested in Hyperstar, you have come to the right place. This video today is all about Hyperstar. We're gonna be talking about all the parts needed to get it to work, installation, collimation, and what a typical night is like to shoot at F2. And tonight is a special night because it's time to capture the Eagle, Eagle Nebula. Nebula. In a mission nebula made famous by the Hubble Space Telescope back in 1995. So I guess first things first, let's talk about some parts. All right, are you ready for this? To shoot at F2 at Hyperstar, you're gonna need a few things. You're gonna need a Celestron SCT. In my case, it's a Celestron C6. Hyperstar, of course. An Astrocam. Star Zone and Filter Drawer. And in my case, because of my Astrocam, 11 millimeter spacer. Always check with Star Arizona to see what your back focus requirements are. Now that we have all the parts, let's take a look on how it all goes together. First thing you wanna do is remove the lens cap from the Hyperstar itself. And then you're gonna remove the retainer ring from the secondary mirror. Be careful when you pull out the secondary mirror and place it gently into the lens cap you removed from the Hyperstar lens. Now attach the retaining ring to lock your secondary in place. It's a nifty little protector case, isn't it? Now you're gonna wanna screw in your Hyperstar, but be careful, don't screw it in too tight, just until it stops and then maybe one eighth of a turn more. Now it's time to attach your filter drawer. And in my case, I'm gonna attach the 11 millimeter spacer ring. This allows me to attach my Astrocam to the filter drawer. And that's it. That's how you put together your Hyperstar on your SCT. All right, so before we Eagle Nebulize, Eagle Nebulize, <laughs> you're probably wondering what all these screws are for. Well, let me show you. So if we're looking at the Hyperstar, and let me tell you, the Hyperstar is very high quality. It's made of solid aluminum, it's not plastic, and it's got a really, really nice weight to it. But if this is the first time you've seen it, you're probably like, man, what the heck are all these screws for on the housing? If you look at it from this side, you'll see a screw that has a thin washer on it, a longer screw, and then a screw that has a thicker washer on it. If you loosen up the screw with the thicker washer on it, and there's two more, you'll be able to turn the Hyperstar independent of the housing, which is really nice when you're trying to frame up targets, right? Frame up targets. <laughs> if you loosen up the screw that has the thin washer on it, you'll be able to collimate this side of the Hyperstar. So I don't know if you can see the movement here, but as I move this screw down to tighten it, this side of the Hyperstar comes up. If I loosen this up, you'll see it come down. And if I need to move it down a little bit further, I can just tighten this screw down and it moves this side down just a little bit further. This is what Star Arizona calls their push-pull method to collimation. And it's a little tricky at first, but once you get a hang of it, it's all good. And speaking of collimation, let's talk about that. If you're anything like me, this might be your first SCT. Damn, I rhymed again. <laughs> and you might be wondering about collimation. Well, I'm gonna give you two options for collimation. And first one is the traditional method. So the traditional method is nothing new. All you have to do is find a really bright star, put it in the center, and then defocus your telescope. Defocused, you will see a really dark circle inside a larger circle. Now that dark circle is supposed to be in the middle of the larger circle. And how you find the thin side of the larger circle is you put your finger or a pen over one of the collimation screws until you find the thin side. After you find the thin side and the screws to adjust, 
you basically just tighten those screws and that dark circle will move away from that side. Your mission is to actually put that dark circle in the middle of the larger circle. Once it's in the larger circle, right in the center, you'll see other lines and circles and they should be evenly spaced and that's how you know you're in collimation. Now that concludes your super crash course in traditional collimation. I know this was just an overview, but if you need additional support, Dylan O'Donnell did a really good job on collimation on an SCT. Check out his channel. I'm sure you'll find it helpful. Now, this is how I collimate the Hyperstar. Basically, I just loosen up all the screws on the Hyperstar, and then I tighten them down with even pressure. Now, when I say tighten them down, I don't really tighten them down. Basically, I move the screws until they stop, and then maybe a quarter turn. So they all have even torque. What this does is it flattens the Hyperstar out completely. And my stars look like this. And since I'm a street astrophotographer, I don't have a lot of time to do this. I need to get imaging right away. So this helps me out out in the field. And for those of you that this might be your first SCT and you're thinking about getting a Hyperstar, this actually might be good news for you because you can do this while you're learning how to actually collimate your scope. All right, here we are, arriving at the Dark Sky site. This is the Portal 6-7 zone. That's interesting. What the... Is the gate open over there? Dude, the gate's open, guys. Dude, let's, let's see if we can shoot from in there. Because, you know, there's no one in there right now. <laughs> oh, snap. I'm in. See, those are those cranes I keep mentioning in my other videos. Whew. See that mound right there? I'm gonna park right there. That's where we're gonna be tonight. <laughs> Gorilla Astro, dude, this is what this is. <laughs> right, here I am inside my old dark sky site, finally. I don't know if someone just left the gate open or if they're just leaving the gate open. The, uh, Advantage of being up here is it's up higher. It's usually when I'm here, I have to shoot over the rooftop over there on the plant farm, right? So I'm up higher in elevation. So it's a little bit easier to capture stuff that's low, like where we're shooting tonight. And the Eagle Nebula should be right up that way. And it's gonna be heading into the west, so it's good I'm gonna be running Hyperstar tonight. I'm going to get set up. It's a little windy. I'm not too worried about it, though. AM5 seems to be do, seems to do really great in the wind. And yeah, it's going to be a good night. And a tip for your wiring, guys. Make sure it's harnessed up already. I got wire ties on here and everything's to length. When you're trying to set, the, set stuff up in the dark, this has helped me 
quite a bit just plugging stuff in. It makes things really easy. Also, the one thing I love about Hyperstar is I'm gonna be out here for about an hour and a half, right? So 30 minutes in each filter. Since Hyperstar is images nine times faster, almost nine times faster than my F5.9 refractor and a little bit more than nine times than my 6.3 F6.3 on my SET. Uh, I should be getting a ton of data, usable data, uh, on the Eagle Nebula tonight. So that's one of the best things about Hyperstar is that's the trade-off. So you might not get the best stars with it, but if that doesn't bother you, then shooting at F2 is uh, going to be really advantageous for you because it's able to gather a lot of data in a really short amount of time. Man, guys, I just got to tell you, it's really nice being here. My uh, old parking spot that I used to park at when I was able to come here all the time, this is right over there. I can, I can see it right now. It's crazy. But all these cranes are up here now. It's trippy seeing all that. So here's where it gets a little dicey. It's when you have to swap filters. So I'm gonna have to remove the dew shield. I'm gonna do that real carefully. I don't wanna hit my camera. And I remove the filter slider like this. See it? Right here. And I swap filters like that. Can't see it because of my headlamp, but that's how it's happening. <laughs> All right, here's my HA. Put it in there like that. I'll put my dew shield back on carefully <laughs> and now I'll have to refocus and start shooting my HA so that's kind of how that goes it's really cumbersome and sometimes a pain in the ass but it's actually worth the results so but that's what it looks like so I got my first sub back on HA and check it out here this is a ton of data here in HA. This is one single sub right here. That is crazy. So I'm getting the eagle well defined and then also a lot of the outer nebulosity here. I'm really going to be excited to expose all this. This is a lot of data. And with Hyperstar, You'll notice the vignetting here. You're gonna get that on Hyperstar. Uh, but if you take flats, this should not be an issue for you. It's also worth noting that with every filter change, I refocus, of course, and I always plate solve after that because I'm moving the dew shield off and I wanna make sure that my scope is pointing in exactly the same position it was when I started shooting at the beginning of the night. And I'll repeat this for S2 as well. So I'll be doing that, you know, three times a night, sometimes more depending on the night, but at least three times. So uh, that's the one thing about Hyperstar. It's pretty high maintenance during the night, but you're getting a ton of data in a short amount of time. So that's also a good trade-off because I mean I'll be collecting an hour and a half of data tonight and I'll be making a full narrowband SHO photo uh, with this data so it's right now I'm, I'm getting really excited looking at this HA. Well I guess that's all she wrote for tonight taking my last set of flats and uh, yeah I get to go home and get a good night's sleep ish. <laughs> hey guys, welcome back. <laughs> I 
I went this whole time without screwing around and I just, I just have to screw around sometimes. <laughs> Let's take a look at some accessories for your Hyperstar because these are some things that you're gonna wanna strongly consider when you're shooting with Hyperstar. All right, so in this case, as you know, I shoot with a C6 and Hyperstar. So the first thing that you're probably gonna wanna look at is a case. And I have this eight inch case by Universal Astro. So I got this pretty long time ago and um, it's actually held up over this year quite a bit. And I like this case that it's a little bit oversized because, of, well, you'll see here in just a second. You can fit a lot of things in this pouch and I love it. And it's also semi water resistant. So that's pretty nice. But here's why I like this oversized case. So of course I fit my SCT in here, right? In with my SCT, I can fit my Astro Cam in there. And also Hyperstar itself. And you'll see my SCT is in here all safe and sound, right? Let me bring it out for a minute because the next accessory you're gonna wanna get is actually on my SCT. Okay, so here's the C6. And one thing you're really, really gonna wanna buy, especially if you do winter Astro, move that out of the way, is the dew heater ring. So here's, I don't know if I can close up on here real quick, maybe not. There it is. This is the six inch Celestron dew heater ring uh, for the C6. It works really, really good actually. Um, and I just plug it straight into my ASI Air. No problems with running it. So definitely get one of these if you're shooting in the winter time because do really likes collecting on a big corrector plate like this. Okay, the next thing you wanna get is some type of dew shield. I use the aluminum dew shield for the C6. I like this for many reasons. The big reason for this though is, wait, let me take this off real quick. Maybe, hold on. So the one thing about this dew shield that I like the best is it always holds its shape. And there's these tabs on here on the inside. I don't know if you can see them right there. They're right here. And they're kind of guide tabs, so it'll sit on the corrector plate. Well, not on the corrector plate, but go around the housing of the corrector plate. and. It's nice because it tells you when to stop putting it on there. It also has these grooves here for the rails on the C6 on both sides. So you can have a top rail on here for mounting. So these are nice little cutouts. And in doing so, having the tabs and these little rail guides here, your dew shield will sit in exactly the same spot every single time you put it in. This makes it handy for shooting flats and with Hyperstar, you're definitely gonna wanna shoot flats with Hyperstar. Just because of the design of the SCT itself, you're gonna get a lot of vignetting on it, right? So you're gonna wanna take flats so you can correct that out of your, out of your subframes. Also, there's this little notch here, right here, and allows you to pass uh, wires from the front of your SCT to the side of it. Now these are originally designed to carry the cables from the dew heater ring, but I use them to not only carry the cable from the dew heater ring, but the USB cables from my Astro camera to my ASI Air. It's large enough that I can squeeze them through here. Also, last but not least, is this rubber gasket on the side of this or on the top of this. I really like this because I can put it on my car without worrying about scratching it. So you can get the flexible dew shield by Celestron, but what I found is it never sits in the same spot and it's always some weird shape when I start taking flats. Uh, with this, I don't really have to worry about it anymore. Next up are the filters. So 
I shoot with standard seven nanometer filters from ZWO and they work very, very well uh, with Hyperstar. With Hyperstar shooting at F2, it actually calls for a special filter because of the SET's design and the central obstruction. Sometimes some filters you'll use in front of Hyperstar, you won't get any data with it. Uh, and it's, that's actually called bandpass shift. Uh, what I've seen from the seven nanometer narrowband filters is, I think they are at such a wide bandpass that bandpass shift doesn't really affect these. And I'm able to get really strong signal out of these seven nanometer filters. So know that, all right? If you shoot narrow band with Hyperstar, you're gonna need filters that are meant to shoot at F2. Otherwise you run the risk of not getting any data collected at all. So those are, that's one tip about Hyperstar that uh, you wanna look out for because it's often overlooked. Uh, I also have this Antlia three nanometer. I don't know if I could see it here. Here it is. This is my first three nanometer Antlia and this is where you're gonna run into issues with Hyperstar. So when I bought this, I wasn't really sure that this Antlia, <laughs> this Antlia three nanometer O3 filter would work with Hyperstar because Antlia claims that this will shoot down to F3. Now, they also said that it did meet the standard for Hyperstar, but they didn't actually call out that it would work with Hyperstar. So these definitely work. This Antlia Pro filter will work with Hyperstar just fine. It brings in a lot of strong signal, but what I've also seen too is the narrower the bandpass that you go, the more vignetting you're going to get in your sub. So know that flats are going to be necessary when you do shoot with Hyperstar. There are times where, you know, I have actually edited without flats. Honestly, sometimes I'm just lazy and, you know, my, my end result is very good still you know, but it took a lot of processing to get there. So I don't want to say that it's impossible to get a good photograph without shooting flats. It just, it's a whole hell of a lot easier when you do shoot with flats, just because of the vignetting you're going to get from Hyperstar itself. And it's more pronounced with filters shooting lower than seven nanometers. So just know that. Okay. And then I just have standard ZWO LRGB filters. I actually replaced the L with this really cheap SV Boney CLS filter. I don't know if I can get that in the shot. Yeah, there you go. This thing was like 20 bucks, maybe $20. I'm not, I don't remember, but it does a really good job of uh, shooting luminance because I've I have a lot of light pollution out here and you don't really need any special LRGB filters with Hyperstar. It basically brings in so much light all at once. The only thing you want to look out for is how long your exposures are. So if you, if you want minimal vignetting from, from RGB, if you're going to shoot an RGB, you're going to want to shoot with super short sub exposures. You can shoot with one minute, two minute, three minute subs, but just know that the vignetting you're gonna get because of the design of the SET will be even more pronounced when you start stacking. So you need a happy medium, right? And since Hyperstar shoots nine times faster than say an F6 refractor, your equivalent time to shoot, if you were going to do two minutes, is about 10 seconds, anywhere in between 10 to 15 seconds. I know it's crazy, right? And this is where Hyperstar is just 
totally amazing. So if you're shooting RGB, you know, you could either at F6, you can either get an hour of data shooting two minutes. You'll get, you know, 30 subs at two minutes to get an hour of data, right? Or you can shoot 30 10 second subs and get the equivalent data to what you would be shooting at F6. Crazy, right? I mean, think about how much time you'll save by doing that. And I, I don't do this in narrowband at all. I'll still, shoot, I'll still shoot with one to two minute subs in narrowband because I'm trying to expose the outer nebulosity. I'm, I'm not trying to capture just the object itself, but I want to capture everything around it as well. So that takes longer exposures. And I don't really have a problem with calibrating vignetting out on, you know, in narrow band, but in RGB, it's a big problem. So I just wanted to put that out there, guys, that if you're going to shoot with narrow band, hey, you're not going to really have any issues. The moment that you go and shoot with RGB though, this is when uh, processing comes into play because you will be processing an RGB sub a lot differently than you'll be processing a narrow band sub. So just know that going in. All right, now that we got that out of the way guys, let's go take a look at the data we got on the Eagle Nebula. <laughs> Let's take a look at our data, shall we? So right up here is the Antlia 3 nanometer O3 filter with Hyperstar. And actually that's kind of a uh, crop in here. <laughs> there it is. So here it is, here's what it looks like natively out of Hyperstar. And I shot it in 47 megapixels because I wasn't sure if I was going to crop in or not but I really like the wide field on this. Anyways, here's the O3, and you can see everything's pretty well defined. Here's the S2, and you'll see some stacking artifacts here. I just wanted to point that out to you guys. Uh, I bumped my scope and it didn't line up very well. That's okay though. And here's my HA subs. And I especially like how the Dark Nebula came out in this filter. Here's everything all combined together. Taco's like, picking his nails, man. <laughs> Do you hear that? <laughs> Let's go grab him real quick. Taco, why you gotta be making noises? Why you gotta be making noises, buddy? Hey, camera's over here, look. Do you want to say hi to people? No, check it out. Buddy. There you go. And you're about to jump off the table, aren't you? Nice. Nice shot. He's totally wrecking this shot, by the way. <laughs> Maybe it was a mistake to bring him up here. What do you guys think? So this was my fault for bringing him up here, by the way. <laughs> Are you done, honey? Yeah, you're done. <laughs> as I was saying, <laughs> as I was saying, here it is all put together. And let's take a look at the stars because I'm sure you guys are interested in what the stars look like. So let's zoom in on it here. The stars look really, really good. Uh, I think the only thing I'm gonna do to this here is crop out the stacking artifacts because you'll see it from merging everything together. But edge to edge looks pretty darn good and I used my collimation method, so I just loosened up the screws and tightened them up again. And these are the kind of results that you can get. 
If you're planning on getting a Hyperstar, I hope this video helped you out in some way. And I guess the last thing to do is enjoy my photo of the Eagle Nebula. And I guess I'll see you in the next one. Peace.